So our first speaker is someone whom I met in my early years in, uh, in biotechnology, um, when he was transitioning from the NGO world to helping companies to navigate the world of NGOs, um, and especially in the area of sustainability. Um, he formed a consultancy called ECOS, um, which coined the phrase triple bottom line. And uh, that served as a mantra for uh, many businesses which were trying at that time to start their sustainability journeys. And um, I followed him over the years via his book, um, which I can wholeheartedly recommend. Um, his blog, uh, his blog is called The Cockatoo Chronicles. So for any of you that know anything about uh, ornithology, um, it gives an obvious clue to his nationality. Um, and of course, if you Google him, you'll get onto his, uh, his TED Talks as well. Um, if there's anyone in this audience who does not believe that climate change is the defining problem of our generation, then I suggest you listen very intently to our next speaker. So with that, please welcome Paul Gilding. Thank you, Ian. Good to, good to see you again after all these years, or well, over many years, I should say. Look, it's great to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about the very big picture. I'll probably be the least bioeconomy focused person you'll listen to the next few, in the next few days. Um, but I really want to put the whole issue in context to give you a sense of what you're doing and why it matters so much to where, what we're all doing um, as a society. Just a little bit more about my background. I've spent uh, around 40 years on sustainability issues, uh, writ large. I started life uh, as, a, as an activist in high school, um, working on social issues, human rights, anti-apartheid, Aboriginal land rights issues, um, moved through a whole range of different uh, questions on, on that side of, of human rights and into, into anti-nuclear weapons issues. Um, I then joined the Australian military, which was a rather unusual career step um, at that point in my activist career. Um, even more unusual, while I, was in, while I was in the Australian military and the Air Force, I started getting re-involved in anti-nuclear weapons activism. So for one part of my life, I spent my weekdays on an Air Force base in, in Western Sydney and my weekend driving inflatable boats in front of visiting American nuclear warships. Um, not a normal career path for an Air Force person. Um, in the end, the Air Force and I agreed that was probably mutually incompatible career choices. And so I should perhaps move on, so I did. Um, I then dedicated myself you know, fully to activism from then on. Uh, working first of all in the areas of peace and nuclear disarmament, moving into the environmental space, joined Greenpeace, uh, joined Greenpeace to, to run campaigns against industrial pollution. Um, this is like late 80s, early 90s, so really, for a man of my age, not that long ago, but in, in terms of this issue, an eon ago. Now, the time when companies would just put their discharge of all their polluting waste into the local creek. Um, the government would say that's not very good, you should change that if you wouldn't mind, if it's not inconvenient sometime in the future that would be really handy. Um, so really just an unimaginable shift in a very short time. That was a period when there was really no controls. You know, when, I, when I was doing that there was no EPA in Australia. Right? And that, that's, this is you know, 25 years ago but not a, not a ridiculously long time ago and we forget how far we've come. And that, I think, is a really important context for my comments, is just how far we've come is nothing compared to how far we're about to go. That we are moving into a very, very different stage of <clears throat> environmental issues, of climate change, of sustainability, and what it means to the economy. And that's really the kind of the focus of my, of my remarks. So let's just you know, think about this issue at its core. And Ian mentioned this in the opening, that there, there is, you know, sustainability is fundamentally, I think, a clash between growth and the availability of resources. I define resources as the climate, as the availability of physical, physical resources, all that sort of broad definition of resources. We cannot have an infinite growth economy in the current model, right, given the inability of the earth to support that economy. This is not a story about the end of growth, although I can do that if you'd like, um, because of the current path we're on is going to revolve, evolve into the end of growth if we don't change. But my main story to you is not that this resource constraint means we won't grow. My main story is that we won't grow unless we change radically. 
and the pace of growth and the exponential nature of growth and the very mathematics of infinite compound growth means that if we don't change in a genuinely transformational way, we are going to destroy the economy. The environment will go down with it, but we don't really care about that that much, frankly. But we do care about the economy, and we care about the economy very deeply. In fact, that's the main, main focus of every policy of every company, of the great massive momentum in the economy is all about growth. So this is a threat to growth. And a threat to growth will get our attention a whole lot more than a threat to the environment will, unfortunately, from where I come from. But that's the reality in which we live. So if we don't, if we don't just think about the very, very simple numbers on this, we currently, according to the Global Footprint Network, have about 1.6 Earth's worth of an economy. In other words, the amount of physical space and resources we need on a renewable basis to support the current economy, right? we need 1.6 Earth's for that. That sounds sort of scary, and people put it, it, put it to us as a sort of, this is unsustainability. That's not the main problem, because going from 1.6 Earth to 1 Earth wouldn't be that difficult, frankly, with efficiency and, and new technologies and so on. The issue is that if we keep on growing at the rate we assume we're going to grow, we're going to need three or four, four Earths, even allowing for efficiency gains by 2050. So you may have noticed that's a bit of a problem because there aren't three or four Earths available to us, at least not in a convenient location and certainly not where we can transport nine billion people to very easily. So that idea that our current model has any hope of continuing on is so fundamentally flawed, it is amazing that people aren't paying attention to it at a higher level. So think about it just in terms of China, which I think is sort of my kind of whole theory on the great disruption is happening on, in China on steroids, is that you know, at, at a 7% growth rate, that means that you think about all the physical impacts of the Chinese economy today on China, and consider cleaning up, getting more efficient, etc. But even allowing for that, the impacts, the physical impacts of the Chinese economy on China will double in the next 10 years and quadruple in the next 20. So the point of that is not that it's bad for the environment or bad for air quality. The point of that is it's not going to happen because these are physical resources. This is physics and chemistry, right? It's not philosophy. And that, that barrier we're coming to, I think, frames this whole issue and also frames the enormous opportunity that we have to, to change things. So the point of all that is really to say we have come to a point where at last, after 40 years of me kind of waiting for the moment where sustainability has arrived into the economy, where this is fundamentally an economic issue, right? And we will therefore change in very profound ways because it's an economic issue. This is not a doom and gloom story. This is a story that we are going to have to change in such dramatic and transformational ways, right? That it's going to create enormous amount of economic activity, huge innovation and growth, Right? Extraordinarily exciting shifts, as long as you're ready for it, which many companies, which we'll come back to, won't be and won't succeed in that process. But the market and capitalism is like the perfect vehicle for that transition, the perfect vehicle for a transformation of that scale and size and speed. And that is the, the essence, if you like, of where I think we're going as a society, is that we have this very consistent habit as individuals, as companies, as governments as, and as a collective uh, humanity when we're facing what we're facing, which is an existential crisis, right? And, and this is, I'll come back to, really is an existential crisis. If we don't change, we are so fundamentally threatened, we'll be forced to change. When we're faced with threats like that, whether it be personal health, World War II, you know, a financial crisis in a company, whatever the crisis is, we tend to follow a very consistent pattern, right? And that is that we wait until, we, first of all, we deny there's a problem. Right? And then we say, look, it's a bit of a problem, but we can manage it. Right? And then we say, look, it probably is really a serious problem and someone really ought to fix it. Um, and then we say, it's really a problem and you should fix it. Um, and then we realise that nobody's in charge and nobody's going to fix it. <clears throat> and then we wait till the crisis becomes totally unmanageable, totally overwhelming, and we are forced to respond as urgently as possible. And then we wait a bit longer. And then we panic and respond and we fix it. Right? And that is what we do. Now, I used to get annoyed about that. I used to be sad about that. I used to get frustrated about that. But I'm like, oh, that's, that's the way it is. That's what we do. So the good news in that 
as Ian alluded to, is that we are facing a serious existential risk of collapse of civilization, which is really good news. Because if we weren't facing an existential crisis risk of collapse as a civilization, we would, probably wouldn't do anything. <clears throat> but the good news is that <clears throat> the way climate change is going, the way that pollution is going, the way that inequality is going, the way that that's causing instability, refugee crises, etc., etc., is if we don't fix it, we are in such serious trouble, right, that we'll be forced to respond. So I say that obviously slightly flippantly that it's good news because a lot of people are going to suffer in that process. But that is the reality of how we do things as a society. So you can look at that and say, well, that's sort of uh, unfortunate, and it, which it is. But you can also look at it and say, OK, well, I better get ready because that's coming. And the reason it's coming, and I want to be really clear about this, is not because it's the right thing to do. Right? This is not an issue of corporate social responsibility. It's not a question of ethics and morality, though, my God, this issue is layered with issues of ethics and morality. The point is, this is physics, physics and chemistry, and, and we are going to be forced to change, otherwise the consequences are unmanageable. And that's extremely good news, because that means we will respond. Now, that's sort of good news in the big picture. And I am fundamentally an optimistic person who believes that we will change, and we will have massive transformation of the economy, and we will do extraordinary, extraordinarily exciting things, and we'll do them amazingly fast when we do. I also believe that, that the result of this process is going to be good for society. Right? That if we end up with indigenous sources of energy supply in every country, right? if we have a, a situation of energy price deflation, as Bernstein and many other financial analysis are now saying we're going to have because renewables are getting cheaper and cheaper, which I'll come back to, right? if we end up with cleaner cities, if we end up with a more distributed energy system a, a stronger, innovative economy, driving more local solutions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, we are going to be a lot better off, right? And we are going to move up the scale, if you like, of of social evolution to a higher form of quality of life, and that's what we've been doing for a long time, which we will do. So that's sort of the good news. <clears throat> the the bad news in this is that the market, which is a beautiful mechanism for driving change is a beautiful mechanism and the way a rainforest is a beautiful mechanism for an ecosystem. But if you're a monkey being eaten by its prey, it doesn't feel so beautiful at the time. So, so a system works because of the inherent process of what Schumpeter, the economist, called creative destruction. Right? The incessant process of destroying the old and replacing it with the new. That's why capitalism works. That's why when I was at Greenpeace, I argued that markets were the right mechanism, for, even from a Greenpeace point of view, for thinking about driving change. So markets work, creative destruction works, we will get through what's coming because we have no choice but to get through what's coming, but the process of transition is going to be brutal, not just for the people who suffer consequences of unsustainability, but for the market participants who aren't, aren't ready. And if we look at that historically, what we say, and this is my, my I do various um, uh, activities now, I advise large companies, BHP Billiton, DSM, um, uh, many companies over the years, Unilever and so on. So I understand how companies think about the issue. I also teach at the University of Cambridge as a visiting fellow um, at the Institute for Sustainability Leadership and my specialty there is really this issue of what, what does it look like if you look at other economic changes. If we think about how change has occurred in technology, in telephones, in computers, in digital photography, etc. What is the process? What does it look like? How fast could we move if we chose to do so and what the consequences would be? And that's where it gets very brutal. And I mean brutal not in a personal sense, but in an economic sense, right, is that this is about destroying large parts of the current economy. And I'll come to my friends at Shell and Exxon in a moment. Um, this is really about destroying the old and building the new. And the evidence of history is, economic history, is that very few companies um, actually do that sort of transition very well. Most of them are destroyed in their effective form and replaced with new companies, right? Because it's very, very hard to adapt to a new world. Now, there are exceptions to that. I used to have DuPont as one of my examples, but that's looking not so good anymore. But the, the, you know, that the different, for different drivers. But you know, there are hundreds of years old companies around who have transitioned. DSM, who I sit on the Sustainability Advisory Board for DSM, just so you know the, the, the context for that. 
Now, is a very good example going from a coal company to a chemical company to a health and nutrition and science company. Right? So it is possible to transition, but it is not normal. And that level of change and transition, I think, is really uh, important to recognise. When it happens quickly, the change is even harder for individual companies, and that transition, therefore, is, is profoundly important. To, to, to give you some examples that are happening today, and this, I really want to be clear, this is not about my forecast for what happens in 10 and 20 years' time. This is my description. The reason I use the Cockatoo Chronicles is I feel as I'm chronicling what's happening today. I'm observing um, what's happening today, and we're seeing it live before us in the energy sector where we saw exactly what Schumpeter talked about of the old being destroyed to make way for the new and disruptors taking over market space. Now, it's a really good, I think, example for the bioeconomy. Because on the one hand, this is just new technology. Right? And new technology gets applied by companies who have the right capital, the right R&D capacity into a new space. In the, in the renewable space, that's what everyone thought this was about that we would simply, when we got solar and wind to be price competitive with new coal and nuclear plants, we would simply build them instead of them, and the same companies would do it. What actually happened was disruptive companies came in because it wasn't just a technology, it was a system change. Uh, and there's a great article in The Economist from a couple of years ago referring to this process called How to Lose Half a Trillion Euros. And it talked about how the energy utilities in Europe had lost half a trillion euros, that's quite a bit of money, even in euros. Um, th that amount of loss happened not because of a technology shift, but because of a system shift. Simply put, when solar enters the energy market, it behaves in a different way than anything else does. So when before, you know, if you look at a simple price curve of the market, energy market during a, during a summer day, even in somewhere that I don't think is very warm coming from Australia, like Germany, um, then you, know, you have this market going up during the day of price and that higher part of the market was where big utilities made their money on base load power. Now the renewables came in and Solar said, actually I like that time of day, I'll, go, I'll, I'll therefore maximise my production and the price will go down. So they saved all the value off the high market cost of energy in the energy system and it happened on a distributed basis. So it was a, it was a system shift and now we're seeing with batteries matched with solar and electric cars, a fundamental change happening in the energy markets globally, which is going to change not just the technology, but who plays. Now, I spent um, many years of my life, seven years of my life working inside the Ford Motor Company, who told me absolutely certainly electric cars would never work. And Paul, you don't understand, it's not a technology problem, it's a physics problem, right? It simply cannot get that amount of power in that amount of weight, it's never going to work. Stop talking to us about it. The future is something else, but it's certainly not that. It's never going to happen. And they're crap and they go slow and they don't work anyway, and it's just not going to happen. Now, why would it be that a guy who founded PayPal worked out how to be a car company before the world's biggest car companies did? It's not because Ford's stupid. It's not because GM's stupid, because they've got some extremely smart people, like Shell, who I'll still come back to. Um, <laughs> But this, this sort of idea that, that an old company can change is so flawed and it's so clear that it doesn't often happen, yet we keep on forgetting that process. And I say this not to say all old companies are going to die, because they're not, but to put out the challenge, both to you in the audience who are new businesses, disruptive businesses, and who are from large companies, that this is a very different world, and how you react in this change is really important, is my kind of key point. So that, that kind of idea that Tesla, I mean, think, think of this in terms of pure markets. Like last, you know, a couple of years ago, the last time I looked at the numbers properly, Tesla produced 40,000 cars, right? Made a loss on every one, right? 40,000 cars, GM produced 9 million cars. So if you're a 9 million car company with an inc incredible sales and marketing and distribution and supply chain system we've had going for a very long time. You're a nine million car company, you're looking at a 40,000 car company and you think that's just like not even a pimple. Right? I wouldn't even notice it in my life. Um, it's not even worth thinking about apart from perhaps some, some intellectual entertainment. The market said, well, not quite, actually. We're gonna value Tesla with its 40,000 loss making cars at more than half the value we put on GM with its nine million profitable cars and its, its, its incumbent power. 
So the market is not doing any great analysis of climate change or disruptive change. They're just saying, look, I actually kind of just instinctively feel that you're old and fat and lazy and slow and you're not going to get it because you're GM. And this guy, this, this company has just cracked something here. Now, there's a little bit, we would all agree, of irrational exuberance in that sort of valuation of Tesla at this stage, but the principle doesn't change, which is the markets speak with their money and they're saying, we think the new ones are going to succeed against the old ones because there's something really, really hard about changing your culture and the way you operate in this space. Now, just on, onto the issue of, which I promised to come back to, of Shell and Exxon and big oil companies. I did a talk at the um, at an FT conference recently on energy disruption, um, the, the future of oil, coal and gas in post, post Paris. And so I spent more time looking specifically at the oil companies and, and why they haven't changed, right? And why they don't appear to be in the process of changing to any significant degree. And my conclusion is that they won't because they can't. Right? They had a chance five, ten years ago, um, and BP, Beyond Petroleum, Shell, I mean, the, I mean, and again, these are not silly people. I mean, by, we all know that there are some of the best minds in the world working in this industry. So what is it about large companies that can't see the change coming? What is it about that culture that says, I can't, I can't actually see that shift? So my NGO friends would say, well, they should become energy companies. And I, my response is, why, would, why is Shell not an energy company? Right? Shell's an oil company. Right? They dig holes. Right? They drill very deeply in complicated environments. They do enormous, complex project management. They're not an energy company. There's no inherent logic to them being an energy company. So what would they become? And that's where we fall all the time. We think about what these companies do and how they could change, and we forget what they become may not be related to their current sector, but is actually related to their competency. I mean, DuPont, I think, is a classic example of doing this very, very well. Had some good advice in the process. Um, but seeing themselves as a science company. They said, we're not a chemical company. I mean, chemicals are what we produce, but we're not in the chemical industry. We're a science company. You know, DSM, similar kind of conclusion. What are we really, what is our core competency? Right, it's science rather than the, what we produce. And that is the story, I think, of the companies that survive and transition versus those that don't. So that sort of first part of my story is really about saying <clears throat> we are now facing an existential crisis as a society. There is an absolute fundamental question of physics and capacity and resources and chemicals and climate change, etc. that means we will be forced to change. Right? And if we aren't forced, if we don't change, then we will collapse, which means therefore we'll change. Right? There is no chance of climate change getting out of control because as soon as it starts to get out of control, it's going to crash the economy. Right? And therefore, the economy won't cause the emissions that makes it get out of control. But that's not a good story from our point of view. Our point of view, we need the change to happen. Therefore, this is an economic change. Right? Therefore, we have to face up to the reality that, that in that change process, we have to be very, very alert to what a genuine transformational change looks like and not be confused or, or hoodwinked by this idea that it's going to be a smooth and gentle process of incremental change. It's going to be a radical disruptive change, as we're now seeing in the energy sector. And we are now, you know, just think about the basics, back to the Shell story, think about the very basics of, of, of the fact that today we are seeing in the Middle East, where the sun is obviously very good uh, for solar power, we're seeing solar coming in on a reverse auction bidding process cheaper than all the alternatives on an unsubsidised basis. Uh, so what that means is that today we have a situation where renewables are price competitive without subsidy right, in many places in the world and a dropping in price, some would argue on a long-term basis by 20% per year, some would argue 30 or 40% recently, but even if you think 10%, imagine if you're in business and your, your costs aren't going down Right? and your competitors' costs are going down on a compound basis at even 10% per year, you're out of business. Right? There is no way we're going to see dramatic cost reductions in terms of production of fossil fuels going into the future. We are going to see dramatic cost reductions in the energy sector because it's become a technology. So the behaviour is more like how iPhones behave in a business system than how coal mines behave in a business system. That's a really crucial difference because what it means is energy becomes cheaper and cheaper. Uh, and more and more available, and that's a very disruptive um, period of change. 
So let me um, think about that now in your context and imagine, just make some comments about the bioeconomy and, and what it means in terms of what that transition looks like and how to kind of get this idea of this opportunity across to society. And I want to make a few comments, uh, but first of all, the context. Um, when I was you know, working with DuPont many years ago, it was right at the crux of the conflict with Monsanto. Right? Uh, between, not you know, obviously between DuPont and Monsanto, I didn't mean that, between Monsanto and the world. Um, and that, that I think is, so I spent a lot of time analysing that, but not from the point of view of a critic of the GMO technology, because I'm not really. Um, I'm cautious and sceptical about some aspects of the overstating of the possibility, but just for the record, I think GMOs, are, uh, the genetic modification and this whole era of technology is very exciting, has enormous potential to do good for the world. So that's sort of my position. So I look at it from the business point of view, I look at it from the point of view of a sustainability person. Um, I don't have a particularly kind of uh, critical view of the technology per se. <clears throat> but I spent a lot of time looking at it from inside DuPont. Not on behalf of DuPont, but from within that sort of lens of how we think about the issues. And I wanted to draw a few conclusions on, on that, just from, from that experience, because I think they still stand today, even though they're some years ago now. <clears throat> And I want to, in particular, give you some advice on what I think you should do as an industry. Obviously, I'm talking you know, to a big and diverse industry. Saying that you're an industry or you're a group is a bit like saying that the NGOs are all kind of one thing, or businesses are one thing. Of course, it's more diverse than that. But generally speaking, the direction of this industry. And I was thinking how to articulate what my advice would be in a way that you'd remember um, and, and sort of hold in your mind. And my first conclusion to come to, with apologies to anybody in the room who's more directly involved, is the simple thing to remember is just remember everything Monsanto did and do the opposite. That Monsanto's approach in this issue is the perfect example of everything that you shouldn't do. Now, again, I'm not criticising the individuals in Monsanto, many friends who work there, you know, obviously good and smart people, very committed to the industry and to the world, but in terms of a strategy, in terms of an approach, Monsanto personifies what not to do. And I should say, you know, that the, the you know, this, this is, in the NG, from the NGO perspective, Monsanto was always kind of the gift that keeps on giving. And, and you couldn't get a better bad guy from the point of view of the NGO sector on this issue than that company and their behaviour. If you think about the idea at the time, I'm going back quite a long time now, to think about the idea you know, who would you want, if you're the NGO community, <clears throat> as an enemy, right, to discredit the whole idea of GMOs? You'd probably want a large, arrogant American, sorry to be racist about this, but this is the very popular at the moment with Trump, but, but you know, a large, arrogant American chemical company, chemical company, with its great reputation for sustainability historically in the US, um, a great, arrogant American chemical company who makes almost all of its money from industrial agriculture, right, who's going to come out and say it's going to save the world, in actual fact it's going to produce products which are only going to benefit industrial agriculture, right, at the time, the products, and that their market was all about that and their products were all about that, but they were telling a very different story. That is like the perfect enemy. I mean, you could not, you couldn't, central casting couldn't do a better job in terms of defining who you would want to oppose and to put Monsanto at that time in those lights in front of the issue. Now, a bit like the shells and other stories, this is not about being a bad company. Uh, it's not about these people being evil people or not having good intentions. I think in some cases that probably doesn't apply, but generally speaking it applies. It's about the strategy that you pursue and what you believe in aligning with what you're doing. So in the case of Monsanto, it was a extraordinary example. When I say the, the gift that keeps on giving, if you look at any online campaigning organisation now, at least one out of three of every one of their fundraising appeals and email appeals is about Monsanto. Now, yes, they all hate Monsanto, perfect enemy, but why do you think they do that? Because it's the gift that keeps on giving. Everybody hates Monsanto. Now, they've come to symbolise bad corporate behaviour. So in terms of mobilising the public, in terms of raising money, etc., they're like the perfect gift that keeps on giving. So I say that obviously a little bit flippantly, but just so you remember very clearly, this is not how to do it. Right? This is not how to do it for some basic strategic reasons 
which I've learned from working with companies for a long time. The first thing is there was not an alignment between what they were saying and what they were doing. Right? The, and I used to use Bob Shapiro's articles in HBR and elsewhere as great examples of a sustainability leader who was genuinely engaging in the opportunity to drive transformational change. And his intellectual articulateness of that was really extremely good. It's just that there was no relationship between that and what they were doing. Right? And you cannot get away with a disconnect between what you say and what you do. Right? And that idea you know, of, of, of we have the technology and we have the answer, and in their case in particular, and if you don't understand that, it's because you're stupid, and let me educate you, right, is just not a very good strategy. It's also, by the way, wrong, because the people who are critiquing these technologies aren't stupid, right, and any more than the people who in Shell or Exxon are all evil. Right? They're just people who are doing, import, doing things with a different point of view. And it can't be like, I'm going to engage you and listen to you before I tell you you're wrong, but I won't say it because I've been told I couldn't say you're wrong, but I'll just think that anyway and be, treat you like that. That's not the answer. This is not a PR question. It's understanding that these people have a different perspective on the world right? and have been told they've been wrong historically on everything. And in fact, in many cases, they've been proved right. So if you're telling an environmental NGO that they don't understand something, remember the cultural context that they come from, which is that they were told climate change wasn't an issue. They were told ozone depletion wasn't an issue, right, from scientists in large companies who said you're wrong about the science. It's, I mean, it's hard to remember how much this has changed. Right? But in the 80s, very large companies with extremely well-informed scientists told the NGO community ozone depletion is not an issue. CFCs aren't causing it. There's no evidence of that. Right? And they were wrong. Climate change, they were told for many, many years they were wrong and ended up being not just right, but off the charts right. Inequality is an issue in society. Many in the NGO would have been arguing inequality is a really important social question for decades and we should address it. And being told they were wrong, markets need inequality, that's how they work. And now we find that inequality is a fundamentally systemic risk to society and stability, as we're seeing with Mr Trump in the US at the moment. So this, this whole relationship between the truth and the answer, and someone being right and someone being wrong, which, of course, both sides in this debate really you know, enjoy being in that place of, of being the righteous ones, right, is a very bad strategy, and it's wrong. So from both points of view, engaging in that you know, from a different way is, is really a crucial, crucial lesson. The second and, and final point I want to make about that whole issue of how all this applies to the bioeconomy is that it's, and I've learned this really, probably the most important thing I've learned in working in two, for over two decades now inside the corporate sector, is the issue of a purpose being central to what you do, how you think and how you behave. And if I go back to companies that I think have done very well on these issues, like a DuPont, like a DSM, like a Unilever, right, they're all companies that have purpose central, not just to their marketing strategy, right, but to their business strategy. They come at this issue from the point of genuinely wanting to improve the state of the world. Not from the point of view of, hey, we've got a great technology that makes the world a better place, let's use the whole sustainability argument to sell it, different idea. Right? Actually coming deeply and culturally from that point of view of saying we're here to make the world a better place. Not as an NGO, not for profit. Right? We're doing it as a company and we intend to make money in this process because we think that's a really good mechanism for driving lots of change. There's nothing, no need to be apologetic about being commercially successful. But being commercially successful because you're meeting the needs of the world Right? Coming from the point of view of purpose and intention to do that, I think, is profound and a very significant difference between how other people have taken these new technology uses going forward. It doesn't mean you market it that way all the time. You look at Tesla you know, as an example. Their marketing is all about the speed of their cars, the cool technology, amazing things to drive, really, really exciting. You look at what Elon Musk says as to why he's doing it, Right? And it's very clear that he's out to destroy the fossil fuel industry in order, in order to stop climate change and transform the world's approach to energy. Now, that's the intention. The purpose permeates the company. It's very clear. That's different from the marketing of the technology. 
So this idea that purpose is central, I think, is really, you know, perhaps the most important issue for your industry. Is that are you genuinely aligned with the need to address these issues, or are you realising that that's actually a really good way of selling the technology to government and policymakers and stakeholders? Very different ideas. Uh, so if you really can get to the point where you challenge yourself, is this, are we doing the thing that society needs? Are we actually satisfying a fundamental requirement for society to move towards sustainability? Because if you are, then your friends are the people who are also doing that. That means the NGO community who's advocating for those issues is going to want to talk to you about how to advance that cause. Right? It means that policymakers who are looking to achieve those changes are going to become your partners in that process. It means that your people who work for you directly are also going to feel deeply engaged about where you're going as a company and why you exist. And that to me is like the, the, the crucial difference between a company which is going to succeed and going to survive in this complex interconnected world uh, and companies that are just going to provide a solution. And I think there are many cases we can see of both those applying and I would argue it's very clear that companies that are driven by purpose are fundamentally stronger companies, right, have stronger stakeholder relationships and are much more likely to be supported by the community at large as a result of that being a very genuine intent. Now I'm not underplaying the challenge of moving beyond the history of biofuels and GMOs, etc. There are some really big communication challenges and some really big engagement challenges, but to me, they come from the point of view of intention. They come from the point of view of purpose and why, why you exist. So and let me close, close there with just a quick summary and then we'll have um, 10 minutes for questions. Um, just to emphasise, this is an economic issue. Right? I come to you with 40 years on sustainability, having dedicated my life to driving sustainability, I'm telling you it has arrived in the economy. And that is extremely good news because markets are very, very good at these big transformational changes. It is, you know, Joseph Schumpeter, the Austrian economist I referred to, is the ultimate revenge, you know, for the activist community that the market will destroy the oil companies as they have already destroyed the coal companies. Right? So that process of change is going is now rolling out through the economy where we've seen most US coal companies, for example, go bankrupt or lose 90% of their value in the last five years, an extraordinary shift in the energy markets. Um, that is before we get serious about climate change. It is an existential threat. We are going to change in dramatic and unprecedented ways and the result of that will be large amounts of the economy being destroyed and being recreated in different forms and the result will be a good thing for society. My final point to summarise is that ask yourself in your company, in your heart, with your family, why are you doing this? Right? And be really clear that of course you need, if you're in business, to make money and be commercially successful, but the intention behind that to really make the world a better place, to genuinely improve the quality of life for people across the board has to come from the heart, it has to be very genuine, and if it is, then almost all of your other issues will get solved in that process with some intelligent application of, of, of your extraordinary capacity for thinking. Thank you.